Well, welcome back. Thank you, everybody. I think that was an exceptional performance from Brandon and his band, BX2. You saw them first here. Another round of applause for them. They were absolutely excellent. Very inspiring. Thank you. Excellent. Come back to Edge 2014. So yesterday, we focused on why infrastructure matters. We heard great insight from our clients and subject matter experts. And I've enjoyed having the opportunity to have many conversations with many of you around the topics of yesterday's conversation. But let's keep the dialogue going today. And let me remind you that you can do that not just by talking one-on-one -on -one and networking in the sessions and outside of the sessions, but also using hashtag IBM Edge. Lots of great conversations going on there too. So, infrastructure solutions such as storage, pure systems, and of course, System X. Our thousands of client engagements around the world have demonstrated that IBM is transforming businesses with speed and conviction and helping them achieve competitive advantage to face the challenges in the new 21st century model. Cloud analytics, mobile big data analytics and people-centric engagement. And we're going to get started right now with one of my colleagues from the IBM Software Group, Chris O'Connor. Chris. Wow. Good morning. Welcome to day two of Edge. We're going to talk a little bit about the how. How do you take the infrastructure? How do we go integrate and how do we enable the business to move that much faster? So let's talk about your role. Let's talk about what your role is going to be as an IT leader. Yet you have a huge opportunity in front of you in which you bring together the cloud enabled world together with the cloud first world. Let's talk a minute about what that means. Cloud Enabled. It's where you are with a lot of the work that you've done for the past 20 to 30 years. It's where you've kept your systems of record. These are the systems that have your
They bring the cloud-enabled world together with the cloud-first world. And, and that's going to be your role. You're going to play a big role as the moderator. The moderator, the broker, the mediator, whichever word you'd like to say in here. That's going to be you. You're going to be responsible for seamlessly extending the enterprise from what you own to what you need to have. And you're going to bring that together, not always with a purchase order, but you're going to bring that together with being able to seamlessly use infrastructure and your clients and you can make updates on the fly with new processes and new business controls because the infrastructure has enabled the systems of record and the link to the new systems of engagement around the cloud first environment enable you to make that be seamless and work as one. It's integrating across the enterprise. So if you think about that, of course it starts with the cloud enabled world. And it starts with bringing that together with the cloud first world. And it will bring you unprecedented Operating it, it might be bar. Borrowing it. It might be even adding to what you already have, but it's the automation that it brings together what we call a hybrid cloud. Right? That hybrid cloud is a balance between what you own and what you need. cloud without the right infrastructure. You need to have optimization based on what you need for the right compute, storage, and network environment like you're hearing here at the show. Right development tools and being able to grab software as a service as you need it from across the web. 
it's a continuum. It runs over and over and over again. It's being able to get the right tool. You rent it, you bring it in quickly. You apply a pattern across it that lets your environment extend. You bring how you're going to actually build and add to your environment and control cost and accelerate your speed to delivery. Next, you put in new programming paradigms. Not sure how many of you saw this, but at this year's uh, Pulse conference, we launched IBM Bluemix to own or apply or build resources underneath the ability. to make an application. You can go out on the web and you can construct enterprise class applications with a services oriented integration that then you can apply on top of the patterns and the architecture with your systems of record that you already have. Go try it out. If you'd like to get a beta account, they're out there right now. And then last, launched here just last month, IBM as a service. It's a marketplace. It's a marketplace of software as a service offerings that IBM has and other complementary people in the industry have as well. Welcome, my friend. Say all thanks for joining us today. Where there's no longer a Reconstituting it, and, and do you take that all the way out to your commercial customers? Are they seeing new business models, new data models of Valve? Sure, so one thing about G Capital is we are really focused on, and so part of that is being able to take our data, take our processes, get it in.
And they're, <laughs> they're looking at their empires and asking, what does this do for my job? What does this do for my career? Uh, and for them, they tend to be the smallest group but the loudest. this trend everywhere. <laughs> we also have uh, a no squirrels poster. So if you remember from up, it's like squirrel. And the challenge there is very strong technologists are uh, very passionate about different technologies and right. they're not able to focus on the business outcomes. So as you go through this transformation, it's about making sure we're able to connect the outcomes back to the business so they understand what we're doing and being able to keep the technologists focused on delivering. So that's fantastic. You're on your journey. You've got the linkage coming together. You've got a balance that you're striking. You're playing the moderator, it sounds like, between the groups so that you can bring infrastructure together with the new systems components that are working. Where do you go next? What's next for GE Capital? What's, what's, what's the horizon future? So, you know, the real challenge, once again, is we've got all this data, all these processes, and all these really valuable insights. So how do we come up with these insights very quickly using things like predictive analytics? But it's not just the technical parts. Remember, our audience will be a wide range of mid-market consumers that have a range of technical expertise. So how do you deliver insights to that range of folks with the right user experience so they can quickly make commercial decisions and therefore uh, make better business decisions and therefore be longer, better customers for us? Fantastic, and you're changing your infrastructure as you do this? to be able to enable these types of patterns. Yeah, so it's about speed, consistency, and repeatability uh, from an enterprise point of view. Uh, we're a, a systemically important financial institution, so we have to be able to prove qualitatively and quantitatively that we're operating responsibly. So standards, automation, repeatability, all those become very critical aspects of reducing our compliance response time. So that is, the clock starts when an auditor asks us for information, the clock ends when we are able to supply the data necessary, and how do we reduce that from months to minutes? Right, back to an outcome that connects to the business, they can understand that as an outcome or as a value. We are able to align our IT under the covers to be able to optimize the compliance response time metric. Fantastic. Snehal, I want to thank you for your time. You'll thank be you around first. here for the show and for the conference, and a big round of applause for Snehal. Thank you. All right, thank you. As we bring this segment to a close, we're committed. We're committed to helping you realize the benefits of hybrid cloud. We're committed to not only bringing you components of hybrid cloud, like we've got new infrastructure, or we've got a marketplace, or we've got things that you can use for development tools. We are committed to how they work together. We are committed to how you can take infrastructure and you can add to it, how you can apply patterns across it, and how you can expand so that it's seamless. We're committed to how you can develop and create infrastructure in new ways, and we're committed to how we can continue to expand the standards and the ubiquity of how we make all this happen in one way. So think it, build it, tap into it. I hope you enjoy the show. I want to thank you for your time. All right, well. First of all, thank you, Chris, and thank you, Snehal, for uh, some great insight there. I think Chris, and Chris addressed important points on how to leverage private, public, and or hybrid cloud, depending on your business profile. And of course, the workloads that you might run are a huge influencing factor on the decisions that you have to take. We can also conclude that having the right insights at the right time can create value for an organization as it provides unprecedented opportunities for growth. Infrastructure with balanced data center design delivers an insight at the point of impact when it matters the most. So what's possible when you unleash the power of big data in your infrastructure? That's what our next speaker is here to talk about. But first, let's take a look at this.
Please join me in welcoming General Manager of Development and Manufacturing, Arvind Krishna. Thank you, Stephen. So in addition to Tom and Stephen, let me add my very warm welcome to all of you. It's great to see the room packed so early in the morning, especially given what many of you must be doing last night, but what stay, happens in Vegas stays here. So let me remind you a little bit about what Tom and Stephen talked about yesterday. We fundamentally believe that data is the basis of competitive advantage. You know, as many people will say, data is infinite. Unlike many other natural resources, we are probably not going to run out of it. When you look at what's happened over the past three or four centuries in terms of technology, so steam enabled shipping and many other forms of transportation in the 18th century. You can switch to the 19th and you can say, maybe shipping gave people the imagination to invest in railways and they led to more and more transportation. You can switch to the 20th century and other than hydrocarbons, which was roads, uh, trucks, automobiles, it was also semiconductors enabling a new fuel of innovation. Data is going to be that in the 21st century, because if you think about all these forms of transportation, they actually enabled information and goods to flow. A lot of the goods today are delivered digitally. Now, why do we say data is going to get more infinite? When you think about not just people, which is only six billion of the trillion, you can think about devices, smartphones, tablets, PCs. You now think about attaching an RFID sensor to every railroad car. You think about attaching sensors to pallets of goods. You think about every meter in every home, telling you what energy is consumed. As you think about all of those things, spewing out data and you being able to take advantage of the data is what excites us today. In addition to just data, which is numerical and many people think about it, 90% of this data will be unstructured. Is it text? Is it tweets, of which there's a few hundred or thousand floating around right now? Is it video? Is it image? Is it faces? Is it all the cameras in London? Is it about safety? Is it about x-raying all goods that flow through ports? Is it about safety? Is it about tracking drugs? All of that data is going to allow you and unleash even more value. So as we think about this value, how can we begin to quantify it? You think about that number, and I'm gonna come back to it, $17 trillion in play, and I'll come to it in a moment. But you gotta first expand your horizons. So data today is in silos in every organization. You gotta bring it together. You gotta be able to bring all the data together to look at what's happening. A lot of data today is historical. You're looking backwards. As one of my dear friends and colleagues likes to say, the, often the way we treat data is as if we try to drive looking in the rear view mirror and not looking forward. And you can imagine how that'll go. You need to get away from reporting and analysis looking backwards to trying to be predictive and predict the future. And that's when you at, get the power to apply data into every process and really help to optimize the business, not just manage, that is react to what you're getting in the business. So what's the $17 trillion at play? When you look at trying to optimize how you use natural resources, how you unleash worker productivity, how you solve claims as they're happening with images and real-time processing happening, as you begin to improve customer service, as you begin to unleash all of those aspects, leveraging all of the data that's coming to you, and the imagery that Snehal provided us is, I think, wonderful. So today you'll get the ears saying, well, I don't know whether I can do this, and I don't know whether I can deal with all of this data, and the kings and queens sitting there, but I gotta give him a challenge. He's gotta tell me also, what's the role of Tigger in all of this? Because you do get those jumping, energetic people, but not necessarily always towards a productive angle, right? So, so that imagery is actually applies not just to the cloud world, but to the data world as well. And when you look at $17 trillion, that's a fourth of the global economy. And that's a McKinsey study. And if you look at that, then you say, okay, a fourth is kind of interesting because when you look at big data or cloud, 
that's also about a fourth of the total IT spend that's happening right now. So you say, can I go do this and really improve a fourth of the overall economy? That is a challenge that all of us should take on because it is going to lead to competitive advantage for our enterprises. So after expanding, let's look at an example here. Most people predict that 60% of all cars are going to be connected by 2017. Okay, so cars are connected. The expectation from most consumers is that this is a no charge service. Now, of course, as a business guy, I'll react with there's no such thing as no charge. It's built in somewhere in the price, but it's not a monthly thing that you go pay for, etc. Now, not only is it connected, and it's connected not just for things like real time information, maps, entertainment, but think about predictability of service and quality. Most cars today have anywhere from 40 to 80 sensors. So you sense the vibration in your right front wheel. You go to the mechanic down the street or in your hometown, in all likelihood they're going to come up with some, okay, it's a CV joint, it's an engine, it's a transmission, and a few thousand dollars later you might get satisfied. But how about the manufacturer knowing, well, that kind of vibration probably implies it's, a, it's to your right wheel bearing. Oh, by the way, let me schedule the... Uh, the service appointment, and you get it back a text or a phone call saying, please come in on this date, that's convenient for you, and it gets fixed. Now what's the customer experience and what's likely to be the brand loyalty for you compared to the alternative? So when you think about all of the access, all of the speed, all of the enablement that that creates, and by the way, that's going to also have an impact on your supply chain in terms of parts and availability and all those things, and a much more complete end-to-end -end this thing. So is it in automobile? Is it in what we call the Internet of Things? Or can these abilities be in all of or all industries? If you look at the numbers on this, there's healthcare with the uh, hospital in Ottawa, there's transportation with uh, fleet risk, there is uh, consumer marketing with Aperity. There is semiconductor manufacturing at IBM. And you can go on on these examples across the globe, across Europe, across Africa, across Australia, across North America. If you just think of fleet risk, fleet risk takes 4,500 variables that showcase a driver's habits of driving, taken from instrumentation in the car, taken from other aspects of these people, you build a big analytic model, and you can use that to predict the chance that they're going to have an accident and thereby reduce it. It reduces minor accidents by 20% and serious accidents by 80%. Think about that for any transportation company. But rather than hear it only from me, let's also, we are going to hear it very shortly from one of our clients who's here. This is a client that about half the population absolutely loves and the other half tolerates for the sake of the first half. And that's the National Football League, the NFL. So, so, so when you think about the NFL, many of us think about it as, you know, re recruit the best players and go out there and do it. But there's also a very big business behind it. But rather than hear it from me, let's roll the video. What we're trying to do is deliver the biggest games to the biggest audiences. So all five of our television network partners feel like they've got a bite of that apple but also trying to be fair to all 32 teams. It wouldn't be right to make a fantastic television schedule that is unfair to our clubs. So we're trying to do that balancing act between television and teams, and the technology is helping us see more and more options, see more of the search tree in an effort to find that mathematically optimal one schedule each season. We don't have all our data in place for next year, but as we're tinkering with the 2014 data, I can tell already how much faster we're going. That's going to enable us to get through so much more of the search space and deliver schedules that are going to be even better than anything we've ever seen before. Please join me in welcoming Mike North, Senior Director for Broadcasting at the NFL. Hey, Mike. Good to see you. So, Mike, tell us a little bit about your role and what you do at the NFL. Sure. That video was uh, shot back in March at the uh, X6 launch event um, at the New York Stock Exchange. And at that point, what we were doing was 
we were still gathering from all 32 teams and all five of our network partners the data for this year's schedule. We know who plays whom, you know that based on last year's standings and you know that based on a rotation that we use, but who plays when? Which of the games that are on national television? Who opens at home? Who's got the early season by this year? What's the Monday night football schedule? Which games are going to London? Who's on Thanksgiving? All that data needs to be fed into a system, software, optimization, and hardware, that helps us look through this unmanageably large solution space and find that one needle in a haystack. Interesting. So as you begin to think about this, are there a lot of constraints that you face? Can these teams just play according to what you and the broadcasters want? Or do they come up with their own issues? Everybody's got issues. This is, uh, this is an <laughs> exercise in pain management more than anything else. Uh, just continuing on the analogy, the, the kings and queens are the network partners. They're paying the league billions of dollars and they're expecting outstanding quality football games every week of the year. It's hard to know, obviously, in March, which of those teams are going to be good in September, no less in December. So those are the kings and queens demanding quality, and the Eeyores really are the clubs. We don't want to play a road game on Monday night. We don't want the week four bye. What do you mean we have to go to London? So our job is to balance the team needs with the television partners, and we can't do that without using the data. And as you think about, I mean, you mentioned the teams having these constraints. Is it just they don't want to, or are there actually constraints that come in with respect to either players or other things in terms of impact on the schedule? Sure. I mean, it really is part art and part science. I mean, any fan in here can look at the 256 games and pick the 15 or 20 best ones. So those 15 or 20 have to be in national television windows so that all the fans across the country can see those biggest games. But they can't all be on Sunday night on NBC. They can't all be on ESPN on Monday night. They've got to be spread across all of our partners, not the least of which is our own network, NFL Network. How do you build your own brand? Do you put your best games there? Do you put your B-level games there? How do you build that audience all the while balancing the need for competitive fairness, because at the end of the day, these are still games being played by humans, and all of our best laid plans in March completely go out the window by the time December rolls around. I can, I can imagine that. And, and as you think about this, I assume there's also a big business behind it. The broadcasters are not just about the happiness of the audience, but I guess to make money with the advertisers and all that begins to play a role in what they want. Yeah, no question about it. Somewhere out there is the one magical, mythical, mathematically optimal, perfect schedule. The one that delivers rating gains for all five of our network partners, that delivers competitively fair schedules for all 32 teams. We know this is impossible. The first time you and I talked, the first thing you said to me was, how could you send my New York Giants to Seattle the week after the Monday Night Football <laughs> game? Well. Somewhere in that giant <laughs> schedule, just thinking of the Giants alone, you've got 16 games to be played over 17 weeks, so any one of those 16 games can be played in any week on any one of five network partners at any one of six times. So you start doing the math in your head, 16 factorial times five plus 15 factorial times five. You're talking about hundreds of millions of possibilities just for the Giants. Multiply it by 32, there's 800 quadrillion possible NFL schedules every year. How do we find that one? And I guess international has begun to creep in as well, I guess, which adds some complexity to this problem for you. Sure thing. Like, this problem wasn't hard enough. Uh, now this year, the NFL is playing three games in London, one in week four, one in week eight, one in week ten. Where are those teams the week before they go to London? Are they traveling east if they're coming from the West Coast? The Oakland Raiders are coming to play a game in New England prior to going to London. Where are they the week after? They need to come home to their bye week the week after as you adjust coming back from across the pond. And each of those constraints limits your search space. So yes, it might have been 800 quadrillion at one point, but as soon as you commit to those three London games, it's now 400 quadrillion. And as soon as those six teams have to have their buys the week after, it's now 100 million. And then you don't want to play that Giants game in week four, and this team can't open at home, and that team needs to be at home in week 17. And all of a sudden, that unbelie unbelievably large space is now too narrow, and now we can't find anything. So you got to com compromise, open that space back up, and find that one. So it's pretty clear when you think about this that this is a big data problem, right? When you think of players, teams, 
broadcasters, other constraints, health, travel, schedules. So I'll presume that the infrastructure on which you run these problems is kind of important. No question about it. The more data we can feed into this, the better the schedule is going to be. And it's not just accounting for, oh, this team didn't want a three-game road trip and it's really this team's turn to open at home this year. Television ratings play a role, but travel, player health and safety, how many time zones can they travel and still be ready to play? These West Coast teams traveling east when the San Francisco 49ers come to the New York Giants, they're traveling three time zones to play a 1 o'clock Eastern time Sunday game. That's 10 a.m. body clock to them. What kind of impact does that have on their performance? What does that mean for the rest of their schedule? Where were they the week before? Where are they the week after? Where's their bye week? Where's their Thursday game? All this data has to be fed in. Ticket sales, attendance, television ratings are just a small part of it. The more information we can feed into this, the more likely we're going to land on a schedule that's right for everybody. So, so, so listening to you, Mike, the infrastructure to run all this becomes important. And then I guess it's not just you do it once and you're done. I guess this is iterative where you go back to the broadcasters, go back to the team. So you got to do this again and again and again. It's dangerous going back to the broadcasters and the teams because the answer is always no. But we go through it <laughs> over and over again. And that, that's where the partnership with IBM has been so helpful. In the old days, really not even that long ago, we were lucky to get one schedule done. We'd hand it to the commissioner mid-April, tell him, here's the people who are going to be really disappointed. Your phone's going to ring tomorrow. Now, with the infrastructure in place, with the software, with the optimization, and all the hardware that we've been able to put our hands on, we're seeing dozens, hundreds of finished schedules every day. Look at it in the morning, don't want to do this, don't want to do that, change this rule, alter this constraint, run it again. Come back in tomorrow, where are we now? The new leader in the clubhouse, what do we do to beat that schedule? And iteratively do it over and over again until we're done. Great, so, so, so listening to you, Mike, it's clear that you kind of bring this problem to life. We talked about big data, but here it's about big data being applied in the end to the happiness of all of you. Now, Not all of you. <laughs> many <Hopefully>. of you. <laughs> so, you know, talking about that needle in a haystack, I did notice that you walked up here with this, uh, with this pigskin. I've got one ball. right here. Super Bowl 47 ball. I couldn't find a 48 ball. I need a Baltimore Ravens fan. Do we have a Ravens fan somewhere? Where's the Ravens? Right there, Ravens. You remember here, great example, big data. We put all the rules in place. We put a schedule together two years ago. The Baltimore Ravens needed to convert a fourth and 26 in San Diego just to get into the playoffs and then pull off a 73-yard touchdown pass at the end of the Broncos game in the playoffs just to even get to the Super Bowl. And they get there, they win. So last year, we're counting on them all over the national television schedule, Monday night, Sunday night, everywhere. How'd we do? What happened? <laughs> <laughs> Best laid plans every year. Here you go. That's for you. OK. So Mike, thank Thanks, you Rob. very much. Thank you very much. Thank Enjoy. you for Thanks. sharing your story. So what a great story about bringing big data to life. Who would have thought that even something like team scheduling and what we see and take so naturally on television really takes literally weeks and months of work to all put together and to look at all of those constraints. So now converting all the stories and all of that insight into something that you can take advantage of. You gotta speed up your infrastructure. A great example of that is IBM bringing flash technology into the DS8870, allowing much faster performance, but not just faster performance, reduced energy, reduced flow space, and improved application performance. When in terms of getting access to all of your data, what we've been talking about with software-defined storage, currently codenamed Elastic Storage, allowing you to worry about placement of data, worrying about tiering, and hence reducing the cost, getting petabytes, going to exabytes of data all in one place. Again, unleashing that, what we talked about, getting hold of all of your data and no longer little silos. And then the availability to empower everyone, bring the power of big data, what's often termed Hadoop, but not just, I'll say, open Hadoop, bringing the power of optimization and scheduling and again unleashing the underlying power of the storage and the resilience and all of that with the power and system X additions for Hadoop with all of the IBM software on that. 
So when you look at all of that, those are great examples. There's many sessions on all these topics today, tomorrow, and on the expo floor if you go there in the evening. I'll close by asking you, take advantage of the week, take as much advantage in terms of being able to go to the sessions, go to the expo floor, and learn. And hopefully you'll all come out really excited about big data and not being the Eeyore, but being perhaps a bit closer to the Tigger and excitement. Thank you all. Well, well, thanks again to Arvin and Mike, um, and also again to Sneha. You've really started something here with the kings and queens and the EOR, and now, of course, Tigger gets thrown in as well. Um, I was struck, though, about something that Mike said. He said, you know, what they're doing today was not possible only a few years ago. They got one schedule. It would take weeks to do that one schedule. Now they can do hundreds of schedules in a week. And I think that's incredible if you just think about the capability. And finding that one mythical schedule is obviously the, the whole purpose of what, they're, of what they're doing, their whole intent. And I was struck, it did remind me of something, that in a recent survey, and this is just a kind of set the tone kind of thing around big data. In a recent survey, it was found that by 2015, there would be four times, four times as much digital data on the planet as there is grains of sand. Now, I'm not sure who commissioned that piece of research <laughs> or what their purpose was, but it is a bit of a mind-boggling thing. And you can see that really coming to life in what Mike spoke about in terms of bringing those schedules together. Now, Chris and Arvin covered cloud and analytics. So now we're going to explore how businesses can engage both customers and employees and do this through innovative systems of engagement based on secure social mobile systems, of course, we would like to say optimized by IBM infrastructure. We need answers on how to safely engage in a global culture not defined by age or geography. And to help us reflect on that, I would like to welcome to the stage Vice President, Social Business, IBM Software, Maria Winans. Maria. Good morning. It's great to be here with all of you this morning. It's, it's been, I know, a very exciting couple of days. And before I start this morning, I want to share a quick story about a little girl. Her name is Lily Robinson. About two years ago, Lily wrote a letter to a supermarket chain in the UK called Saintsbury Supermarkets, asking why is Tiger Bread called Tiger bread. It should be called giraffe bread. Love, Lily Robinson, two, three and a half, three and a half years old, three and a half years old. Sainsbury customer manager Chris King, 27 and a half years old, said, and she wrote, he wrote back, Dear Lily, I think renaming tiger bread to giraffe bread is a brilliant idea. It looks much more like the blotches on a giraffe than the stripes of a tiger, doesn't it? And then he went on to explain how this bread was named. It's called tiger bread because the first baker a long time ago thought it looked like the stripes of a tiger. In the past, that might have ended the story right there. But in the era of the empowered customer, Lily's mother started a campaign on Facebook to change tiger bread to giraffe bread at Sainsbury. And she posted a letter with, also with uh, Chris's very thoughtful response. The story went viral. This is a true story. And Sainsbury received such an overwhelming feedback that they decided to rename the, giraffe to, to, the bread to giraffe bread. And I'm sure at no small expense. Look at Lily now. She's made a giraffe out of the bread. She's happy. One person, one little girl wrote a letter. One thoughtful employee responded. And 150,000 Facebook likes later, a major retail chain rebranded a product. 
Sainsbury realized it wasn't just about selling more bread. It was about building strong connections that turn customers into advocates. It's about engaging with people. And as you know, we are living in an era of enormous possibilities and transformation. Over the last day, you've heard from others of why infrastructure matters and how it's enabling composable business, a model that accelerates innovation and opportunities for value creation. As technologies converge, they're also driving a greater demand from cloud, analytics, mobile, social, and security. The shift to systems of engagement is also changing the way we communicate, the way we work, and the way that we engage with people. You've heard from other speakers here today and yesterday of IBM's overarching strategy to maximize on these opportunities. The first two, data and cloud. And what I'm here to talk to you about today is the third opportunity, how to create a strategic and systematic approach to engagement. At IBM, when we speak about engagement, we're talking about people-centric engagement. That means putting people at the center and creating an open and authentic way to engage individuals as individuals instead of segments or categories. This is possible today like no other time in history because of the convergence of cloud, analytics, social, and security. The convergence is giving enterprises the means to meet people where they are. It is arming them with the data and the expertise that is required to personalize every human-to-human -human interaction. It has given them the credibility that is the foundation for trust in a people-centric engagement. So now let's look at what's happening right now as we're sitting here in this conference. What you see is IBM's always-on engagement center. This is about having the power to see real-time visualization of social conversations, content, analytics about your brand. It empowers you to understand your customers, your employees, and your competitors. So this insight can help you evolve your business to engage and respond like never before. Essentially, it lets you listen in on conversations as they happen and gives you an instant read on the sentiments around your brand and how people are experiencing and engaging with your brand. So what this heat map, for example, shows the conversations that are happening about this conference from around the world, not just people here today. And as you can see, we have reached over 52 million people in the last 24 hours with content from this conference. We know who has said what, how they feel, and where, and where they've said it. We also know who's shared it and who's passed that information on to a friend. This presents an incredible opportunity to shape those brand experiences and engage to drive growth. So today, companies no longer have complete control of their brands. Individuals are setting the tone and the context of these conversations like never before at every moment of every day. And your company needs to know what is being said and how to engage with what they're saying. This is how individuals are using social and mobile to reinvent the rules of engagement. 
These technologies make possible new levels of collaboration between individuals and communities. And these same technologies are being used by companies to tap into the benefits of unlocking the value of social capital as a resource and spurring innovation. This dynamic has reached a tipping point. For many years, CEOs consistently ranked market factors as the biggest driver of change within their enterprise. Then in 2012, for the first time ever, they ranked technology at the top. More than market factors, more than people's skills. They believe that technology would have the greatest influence on their organization. We heard Arvind speak to the explosion of unstructured data flowing from mobile, social, and analytics. The companies with the infrastructure to derive value and insight from this data are the ones that will enjoy a competitive advantage. After all, you can't personalize if you can't do the, an the analysis and the analytics. So to get there, you must transfer transform your IT infrastructure to deliver securely through dynamic cloud services. And that means not only complete access to data, but having the storage uh, that will let you analyze that data where it resides. And the platform that will drive those insights and make those available to all your employees. In other words, the right infrastructure for social and mobile matters. It enables IT to scale up and scale down in a responsive and secure framework, which in turn creates opportunities for new business models and open up channels for new customers and revenue sources. These infrastructure demands are one more reason CEOs believe that the impact of emerging technologies on their organizations will be profound. So to address all of this disruption and innovation stemming from these technologies, the CEOs anticipate three actions, three drives for action. One, they must embrace this disruption. They must build shared value, and protect the brand. These are the actions that are required to drive value from people-centric engagement. And companies, particularly outperforming ones, are rising to the challenge. Approximately 43% of all companies are looking to increase their investments in mobile technologies. 72% of CEOs of outperforming enterprises have built organizations that collaborate closely with their customers. And 61% of companies say that cybercrime is the greatest threat to their reputation, underscoring the importance of a fully integrated, analytic-based approach to security and governance. These are the areas for action, but what is a systematic approach to engagement that I spoke about at the beginning? It is an approach that is centered on empowering people and creating mutual value for and with customers, employees, and citizens. Driving this approach is IBM's leadership in social and mobile, underpinned by leading security solutions. So through them, we help organizations achieve speed, responsiveness, and personalization at every touch point with the individual through that value chain.